Hello everyone and uh, we hope you're all well. Welcome to the sixth lesson. I am back. <laughs> I'm back uh, after a five week break. I hope you all had a great five week session and hello five to weeks. you too, Chris. Wow, five weeks, that's a long time. Hey, great to have you back. Great to be, <laughs> great to be in the original position. We're here with the friends. We may have some new friends that have joined us, but we've gone through a lot. We've had a lot of different teachers. We have a lot of different experiences. Mm -hmm. So today I think the lesson might be a little bit different. What do you think? Absolutely. So we're going to kind of um, do a little bit of a summary, a little bit of a wrap up so we can just get back on track. Actually, this lesson is for me to get back on track with you guys. Uh, and I also did want to do a question and answer session to kind of get a feel of um, how you guys are feeling. So it'd be really good if we had an interactive lesson uh, and you could pop any question that you like with respect to the um, five lessons that we had previously with other lecturers. Uh, and I'll be more than glad to go over them. And I'll do a short summary of, uh, of what we did so far and where we should be at, really, um, to continue with the course. Okay, so we're going to have a nice, light question and answer session lesson, okay? And you can ask anything you like, but first what we'd like to do is just have a bit of a summary, okay? Now, before the course started, we had two introductory lessons. So if you kind of missed out on those, you could have watched those as well. And all the other five lessons previously, they're all in the archive. It's really worthwhile to go over them. But before we continue with the lesson, have a bit of a summary, I'd like to just um, give you a heads up on two books that are really, really necessary if you're going to um, continue to study Kabbalah with us at least with Bnei Baruch. And um, one of them is Kabbalah for the student. So if we could have that book. Uh, yep, that's the one, Kabbalah for the student. Samuel from Kenya, he says, I want to get a hard copy of that book. How much does it cost for shipping and shipping charges and everything? That's great. Um, you need to go to kabbalahbooks.info website and you can order it from there. So that's the, that's the most fundamental book in English we have. Okay, oops, sorry about that. Let's just put this back on. So this is a very handy book. This book has everything for us to attain spirituality. Okay, it's like a little encyclopedia. It's quite thick, but it has everything that we really need to cover in order to have spiritual attainment. So I really do recommend it. Um, second is the social writings the writings of Rabash. Uh, this is also a very, very good book. Rabash, uh, as I have mentioned before um, in the first two introductory lectures, is a very, very amazing Kabbalist. Uh, he's also the teacher of our teacher, who is Dr. Michael Lightman. And he's the first Kabbalist who, in fact, wrote how we can apply everything in a practical way in the wisdom of Kabbalah uh, when we're in a group study environment. So it's a very, very important book to have as well. It will give you a really good guidance on how to apply what you learned. Okay, so it's like kind of like swimming. We learn swimming and then we have to jump into the pool to start swimming and that's what the social writings are like. All right, so let's have a bit of a summary. Now, until now we learned about what Kabbalah is and you also learned who Bnei Baruch is. Uh, and according to Bnei Baruch principles, you know that we study the book of Zohar, we study the Tree of Life by Ari, and we actually study the compilation done by Baal HaSulam Yehuda Ashlag, who brought those two amazing Kabbalistic sources together in the, uh, the Zohar and also in the study of the Ten Sefirot. So these are our main books, uh, and obviously these are the two main fundamental books that we study, and the Zohar is obviously the fundamental book of Kabbalah. Uh, and so it's very, very important that we study it. In addition to that, we have articles by Rabash, which I have just mentioned. And also we have many, many articles from Baal HaSulam, uh, who's also, you know, whose articles are also amazing. They very much reflect our um, current situation in the 21st century. And it really is, um, it really is composed in such a way that we in our generation can really relate to it. Unfortunately, when he wrote those articles many years ago, 70, 80, even 100 years ago, he wrote those articles um, before he passed away, a lot of the people couldn't really relate to it because he was talking about globalization, the whole world being interconnected, and, and many of those topics he was covering way before people were even you know, in that, in that level of comprehension of, of living in a global society. So he really actually wrote those for us with a vision 
to give us all he can uh, so we could learn um, we could learn the spiritual fundamentals um, so B'nai Baruch and the sources uh, you know as you know are directed by Dr. Michael Lightman who's our teacher and we here at the Learning Center are doing our best to convey also the information so you can actually one day as well hopefully you'll be joining us and studying with Dr. Lightman as well so it's a very good opportunity as a stepping stone to finish the education center and continue forward now as B'nai Baruch as you know we're a non-profit organization we're a group of Kabbalists located in Petah Tikva and um, and what we do is we have groups all around the world and we all study together and we all have a work framework, uh, a study framework together. And basically, we just carry on studying and doing what Yehuda Ashlag and Rabash uh, Baruch Ashlag taught throughout the years. And we're also obviously teaching those who want to study Kabbalah. Now, that would have been your first lesson. And the first lesson's definition would be what is Kabbalah? And Kabbalah is actually very shortly in one sentence is a way to understand everything that happens in life and why it happens. So that's very important, isn't it? Because all our suffering really in life is not that because we're just suffering out of the blue for things that randomly, seemingly randomly occur, but actually we suffer because we don't know why we're going through these things that do make us suffer. So the Kabbalists are saying, listen, if you really knew the reason behind it, you wouldn't really suffer because it would make sense to you. Okay, just like maybe we go to work and at work maybe we don't like our job and we're really suffering from it. However, we understand that we need to work because we need to buy food, pay rent, pay mortgage, pay social security and, you know, basically live, right? So the Kabbalists are saying, well, we also need to learn how to live in this reality where we need to come to a purpose of reality, the purpose of creation, the purpose of our existence, so Kabbalah is basically a science that a person needs to um, apply and build a new perception of reality so he can really understand why things happen and, and what the Creator is thinking. Uh, and that's all new to us, all right? Because mostly as we've grown up in life, uh, with the things we've learned in school or with our family, our religious background, our cultural background. Nobody really talks about or teaches us the, this thing that we need to attain being the thought of the Creator or the thought of God, all right? Because we go through a lot of religious things or spiritual teachings and so forth, basically to kind of, um, well, to keep our mind at ease from certain thoughts, okay, like what's going to happen after we die, because we have this fear of what's going to happen after life. So Kabbalists are very pragmatically explaining to us that, well, what we need to do is study Kabbalah in order to understand the whole purpose of creation, why things are happening the way they are happening, and why it's actually all good. Now, when we look at the world, we don't really see that it's all good, is it, do we? I mean, it's, it's a big mess out there. However, Kabbalists are saying, well, sometimes as, as children, you know, our parents sometimes, you know, give us a hard time. They push us to develop or they push us to study in school so that we can actually have a better life. Well, the Kabbalists are saying it's the same thing with us. The Creator is kind of pushing us and giving us a bit of a hard time so that we can actually have a really good life. Because as you know, this life is transient. We're born, all of a sudden we wake up, I'm 45. Okay, let's say I thought about the purpose of my life just today. I think, oh my God, I'm 45 years old. And how did that time just go by? It's like a, it's like a bad movie, all right? It's like a bad Hollywood movie. And that's exactly how our life is once we start asking these questions. So it's worthwhile to find out why we're going through all these things and to understand and to attain a certain level of perception, which the Kabbalists describe as attaining eternity, as attaining the same level of existence as the Creator or as, as God or as Allah or as Elohim or whatever you call Him. The name here is not 
really the important thing the concept is so that's the first lesson that you would have gone through uh, with the guys and the second uh, is perception of reality I believe right so the perception of reality is a very tricky business and the reason it's tricky is because the capitalists are talking about a reality that we don't perceive at the moment and when we call Kabbalah a science and then we have Kabbalists talking about <clears throat> the science of Kabbalah and then explaining to us the perception of reality it's a bit airy-fairy and it's a bit airy-fairy because they see things with an additional sense um, some people like to call it the sixth sense, some people like to call it the soul, uh, or some people like to call it the part of the creator. However, that little dot in the heart, that initial pinch that makes us ask about the purpose of life, really becomes an awakening and a starting point to develop this new extrasensory organ, which will actually allow us to perceive reality in a different, let's say, body, all right? When I say body, obviously we're not talking about our oh, meat and flesh because this meat and flesh is just a sack of protein and a sack of protein, just like any other sack of protein, will end up dead. However, this new body that I'm talking about or this, the soul that I'm talking about is actually a new way of existing, which is not far-fetched. And the reason it's not far-fetched is because, well, we can understand, basically, that when we're living in this body, we're alive, okay? So just think about it this way. We have another opportunity to be born in another body, let's say, and let's call it the soul. And that soul exists in an eternal way with full comprehension and full, uh, let's say, attributes of the creator, all right? Kind of like an upgrade to our physical existence so it's not a far-fetched concept because if we can live in this body it's very very possible that we can live in another body and this could be called a sack of protein okay meat and flesh and that will be called a soul and this body can die but that one doesn't okay it's not far-fetched it's quite logical actually now the only thing we need to do is when we're studying Kabbalah, is to get our perception right. So the Kabbalists are saying, well, just like, because as you know, the whole of creation is kind of like a, um, a copy of the spiritual. And just like everything we, that exists in this reality, things exist at a deeper level of understanding and a deeper level of, of um, meaning, of cause, uh, in the spiritual world. So everything that we perceive here has actually a relevant point in spirituality. So having, having learned that in the wisdom of Kabbalah, the Kabbalists are also saying, well, listen, the way we perceive reality is in our bodily senses. I'm just going to draw that. My drawing is not great, but I think you'll get the point. Okay, so that's one. That's two, that's three, that's four, and that's five. Okay, the Kabbalists are saying, well, in our, in our bodily senses, we have five senses. We see, we hear, we smell, we touch, and we taste and everything that we actually get from these sensory organs is an impact from the outside and the Kabbalists are saying because I'm kind of impacted by events or things that are happening on the outside I actually suck all that in and I see things in my head now that might seem a little airy fairy but it's also very logical Everything I see goes through my eyes. Everything I smell, I hear, I taste, I touch, kind of give me an image, an impression of seemingly what's outside of me. So the Kabbalists are saying, well, think of it this way. If all my organs are kind of 
working towards receiving, towards taking in, then I must be living as an outcome of all those sensory organs somewhere where I perceive the outside world to be, but I'm actually living it all inside of me. All right? And this is what they're saying. At the back of the brain, okay, let's call this the brain. Okay, let's say this is my head. And in the back of my head, according to everything that's on the outside, I have an image of this world. Okay, so we have mountains, we have the moon here, we have the stars, and then we have trees. We have animals. I have to excuse my drawing. And, you know, we have rivers, the oceans, etc. And we have man. Okay. And we have a lot of people on the planet, as you know, or 7.5 billion of them. Okay. And all of that, they say, I'm actually living inside of me. So in the perception of reality, in that lesson, they would have talked about Newton. They would have talked about Einstein. They would have talked about um, possibly Everton and, and quantum physics. And then they would have talked about Kabbalah as well when, we, when you were, talk, when you were taught uh, in the second lesson, the perception of reality. And our reality, uh, as perceived in Kabbalah, as, as explained in Kabbalah, is very, very different towards what... Newton, Einstein, and quantum physicists are talking about because they're always talking about what's on the outside or what I'm perceiving or how reality changes. But Kabbalists are talking about only one change, the change that I am going through. And everything on the outside seemingly doesn't change, but only I change. And in physics, seemingly things on the outside change or according to Einstein I change and the outside changes or according to quantum physics anything can change at any moment in time in equal different places at the same time and Kabbalists are saying well not at all everything is not changing anything that's going to change here in this world is just me and how I perceive reality so the perception of reality is a very, very important topic. So I hope you got all that right. And outside of us, they would have taught you in your second lesson, there is just one thing, the Creator Himself. However, we don't feel Him. We just feel how He impacts us by using the whole of this reality which I perceive inside me. And according to everything that he does on me or this world does on me, okay, I go through fluctuations, I go through changes, understandings, and so on. So perception of reality, most important point is in reality only one thing is changing. That's me. Okay? That's why Kabbalists don't blame anybody on the outside. Because they understand that everything on the outside is only an influence of this reality to cause a positive change in me. So we should be using the whole of reality in order to make that positive change inside of us so we can actually attain what we learned in the first lesson, which is the thought of the Creator and His attributes. So that's the first and the second lesson done. The third... And the fifth lesson I'm going to touch on together. Because, because, once we go through this, we'll have a question and answer session. So don't worry. Okay, I'm just doing a summary. So we are going a little fast, but this is just a summary. The third and the fifth lesson was the importance of the books and the choice of environment. Now, environment is very, very important, even if we're not studying Kabbalah, right? Our, our parents always told us or our grandparents told us choose your friends carefully because if you hang around with bad people bad things will happen to you because you're hanging around with bad guys right so if you're hanging out with the mob or if you're hanging around with some bad people you're likely to get hurt but if you're hanging around with decent people with nice people you're more likely to have a good time and a nice pleasant life the Kabbalists 
are also explaining to us that our spiritual development, how, how good we develop, also depends on the environment. Simply because from birth, there's a law that's acting on all of us. The influence of the environment. In fact, a person, as they say, is an outcome of his environment. So a person isn't actually good or bad. He's just born neutral. But if you put him in a bad environment, he'll end up being a bad person. If you put him in a good environment, he'll end up being a good guy. So spiritually, Kabbalists are saying, well, the same principle really applies in spirituality as well. If you want to develop spiritually, you need to be in a, in a let's say, the right kind of spiritual environment. Okay, let's divide our lives into two here. Okay, there we go. You need to be in an environment where it will kind of feed, it will kind of give you the facilities to develop spiritually. And then we have our corporeal life, which is the general environment. So, first of all, as you would have learned in the first lesson, who studies Kabbalah? A person who has a dot in the heart. All right, so this is important. So that's the first criteria. We have a dot in the heart. We call it a dot in the heart. This is an inclination that's inside of us that's really bugging us. You now it keeps asking the question, why are we living? Why am I not happy? What's the meaning of all this? Why are we born anyway? I mean, why would anyone go to the trouble of creating this huge mess? We're just not content with life and we're asking why, basically. And that is the initial starting point of the dot in the heart. The second thing is our bodily life. We sometimes like to call this the donkey. Okay, because our nature is pretty much like a donkey. If you give it a carrot, it'll move forward. Or if you give it a beating on its bum, it will go forward as well. Okay, very simple. Pleasure and pain are the two reins that really govern our corporeal life. So this is why we call this the animate degree, because we live like an animal here. Okay, we go for things that give us pleasure. We run away from things that cause us suffering, or we make a calculation. I'm willing to suffer now because I'm going to get my salary at the end of the month, and that sounds reasonable to me. So that suffering I can bear because I'm expecting a reward afterwards. And then when we have the dot in the heart as well, well, that's a different question altogether. Now this environment, this animate environment that I've, I've grown up in or I live in, it's basically family, friends, work, school, whatever our corporeal existence and all the necessities that we have. Okay, so we have, for example, our culture, whichever country you're from, doesn't matter. We're just surrounded by things that really shaped our animalistic lifestyle. But our character in terms of being a desire to receive pleasure is the same for everyone. All right, so whether you go to Timbuktu or the North Pole to an Eskimo, our nature is not going to change. All right, so in Kabbalah, there's only one race really, and that's the human race. So anyone who has a dot in the heart could be anyone from any part of the world, could be from anywhere, from Timbuktu to Alaska. And if he's asking the purpose of life, the meaning of life, this this dot in the heart, this initial spark of questioning life, needs to be also grown up, it needs to be um, kind of looked after, just like a newborn baby is being looked after by parents. So a newborn baby doesn't really know what to do in life, so nature gives us loving parents so that these parents can actually grow us up and we could learn how to live and adapt to the world that we're living in. Well, the same thing really happens and needs to happen with a dot in the heart. However, a dot in the heart doesn't have parents. <clears throat> but what the Creator does when 
he wakes up this special enthusiasm for the meaning of life is he kind of takes us for a little spin and we like to get into spiritual things religion or philosophy or all kinds of mystical things meditation whatever you whatever that really attracts you we go into a lot of things to find some meaning in life spiritually and in one of those searches seeks the creator will bring a person to kabbalah now there are a thousand and one kabbalistic teachings out there or teachers out there so called and that's all good but here we are called Bnei Baruch and we have a special method our method basically when I say our method this method comes all the way from Adam and in the two previous introductory lectures I spoke about the lineage of the teachers so we have a whole lineage of teachers that these books and these uh, writings have been brought to us by. So what we do is we study the sources. And basically what we need to do now that we're studying, that we found Kabbalah, and if our heart feels right here, okay, because a person can only study something if he feels right about it, right? So if I feel bad or if I don't really think this is the right thing for me, I'm not going to study, am I? So first things first, anyone who kind of has a dot in the heart and he finds uh, the right place, let's say he came to Bnei Baruch, like you guys are here right now, if you feel like, yes, this is the teaching I've been after, then you come to a split. And that split is called decision making. Okay? Because decision making is very important in life, as you know. If you ever chose a career, a spouse, or if you're going to move to a country and make a new beginning, you do your research, don't you? You don't just jump into the water and say, well, okay, you know, I'll just go anywhere. So if you understand and if you feel that this is the right place for you, then a decision needs to happen that you, you want to attain this. And you want to learn and you want to attain and you want to go forward. Once you decide, only then you can be successful, just like with anything in life. If I'm on the if I'm sitting on the bench, all right, if I'm on the middle line there, not really sure about doing something, I won't get anything done in life. This is true for our careers, just like in corporal reality, this is also true for spirituality. So anyone who feels right and feels like, yeah, this is the place for me, I want to study, has to now start building around this dot in the heart a facilitating environment, a nurturing environment. And that's called, in short, let's just do this. Okay. Around this, I have to build a few circles that will influence me. Okay. And these things are called the Rav, which is the teacher, okay? The books, which are the authentic books of Kabbalists, which I've mentioned, or we, our friends in previous lectures would have mentioned, mentioned. And the third are the friends. And then we start building our environment. All of this is our environment. Okay. It's also good to mention here that Rav in Hebrew translates to great, or it's in, in a relation to something, so bigger than, say, me. So if, a, if you're a student and you have a Rav, it's the, then the teacher is just someone who is higher is above than you. you. Yeah. So someone who's higher than me is called a Rav. Here, actually, in Bnei Baruch, we like to think of all our friends kind of like a Rav because we learn a lot, actually, from each other. So every time our friend, because our path is so sacred to us, we see the friends are being as very important. And since the whole of perception of reality basically depends on me and the environment outside of me impacting on me, using every opportunity to see the friend as higher than me actually gives me an opportunity to attain more. So every friend is kind of like a rough too. So this 
these are really the tools that we have to build an environment with next, which is next to our corporeal existence. So on top of our daily lives in this world where we have to go out and work and look after our family and so forth, we have to kind of build an additional environment to nurture this little baby called the dot in the heart. Okay, it's our inclination and it's the beginning point of our soul, let's say. Okay, right now we don't have a soul, by the way. Okay, however, we have a potential to build one. And all of that is only possible by building ourselves an environment. And that choice of environment is called the freedom of choice. So freedom of choice, very practically, is this. I choose whatever is going to benefit me. So if I'm choosing an environment that will benefit me corporeally, that's one choice. If I'm going to choose an environment that's going to benefit spirituality, that's another choice. And the Kabbalists say, well, that's really the only choice you've got in life. Simply because whenever I enter an environment, I'm influenced by that environment. And I'm not really doing anything independently. So the only independent action that I have in life is to choose an environment. And this is the only choice a person has. And it's the only choice a person has with a point in the heart. The reason I say that is because it's simple. If I'm in a corporeal world, let's say I'm not studying spirituality, right? I'm just like a regular guy on the street who's just worried about his corporeal life. I'm just going to choose environments where I profit more according to what I want. Okay? I just want to fulfill my desires. But... Since I'm a desire to receive, that's not really a free choice. It's just a calculation, okay? Because I'm, at the end of the day, wanting to fulfill my desire to receive. So the free choice can only happen when I have two opposite inclinations. That's why people on the outside, they don't have a free choice. Only a student of Kabbalah with a point in the heart who is decisive on attaining spirituality can have free choice. It's a very thin line and it's going to get only thinner as we go forward. But it's not a hard job and it's not an impossible job either. If it was impossible, we wouldn't be doing it. Okay? Nobody would be demanding it from us either, just like we don't demand from babies to solve algebra that are, I don't know, for sixth grade or whatever. Okay? It's because it's a baby, right? It's not going to do it. So, same with us. The Creator gives us an opportunity and the circumstances where we can use our free will in order to nurture and grow our dot in the heart and make a spiritual being out of it. And that's where environment comes into play and that is where freedom of will comes into play as well. All right, Understand that well and if you understand this concept well it'll help you a lot on the path because you'll then see that there is only one place that you need to exert your effort into and that's the environment it's the rav the lessons the friends who are influencing you spiritually and the sources who are guiding us now the the other topic that we go well before we go to the other topic i just want to mention the books because we started off with the books in the in the beginning and i just wanted to say why the books are so important well actually why these things in the environment are so important because a person can read any book really but if you want to attain spirituality you need to read authentic kabbalistic sources being the zohar there we go okay being the uh, tree of life or the study of the ten sephirot of the ten sephirot okay plus the articles of Kabbalists obviously Kabbalists who've attained and who know what they're talking about. 
because some people under the name of Kabbalah sell products like charms and, and mystical waters that can heal you. Obviously that's not really true, is it? All right, by putting some red string on your wrist, you're not going to change your life. Even to believe such a thing is quite childish. The books are very, very important. For one particular reason, they talk about what we should be attaining. And because we're a desire to receive, if I read the right books, and if I aspire, inspire myself, and want to live in the things that they're talking about, I'm actually building a new desire inside of me, not for things of this world, but for what the Creator wants to give us in the first place. As you all know from probably lesson one, we're all a desire to receive. But generally, well not generally, originally, we're a desire to receive pleasure for ourselves. However, if I use the environment with the guidance of the Rav, plus the friends, and I have great influence from this environment, I will begin to develop a new desire. This new desire is called a desire for spirituality. Okay, and this could only be done by studying the right books from the right teacher with the right group of friends, just like in school. If I'm studying physics and a biology teacher comes in to teach me physics, that's not really going to give me the edge, is it? It's just not going to cut it. Well, same thing here. So the Kabbalist needs to be an authentic Kabbalist. He needs to have a lineage. You need to know who his teacher was, who the teacher of his teacher was, and so on. Because the lineage of Kabbalists goes all the way back to guess who? Adam, being the first Kabbalist ever. So having a good lineage and an authentic Kabbalist as your guide is very, very important. And to use the books of those authentic Kabbalists are also very important. The friends are going to give you extra support and they're going to make sure you don't fail. But the freedom of choice to choose the environment is on you. So that onus on you is where you need to make your effort. So a lot of people say Kabbalah is hard, this and that. This, If it was hard, impossible, nobody could do it. And we wouldn't have any Kabbalists to t talk about it in the first place. So because there are Kabbalists in the past and right now as well, we have the Rav, it's obviously possible. So all we have to do is give the right effort where it needs to be given. And that's on the right decision in the environment. So that would have wrapped up the books and the environment lesson. I just want to throw in really quickly, Paradzi, remember Paradzi from yeah. Zimbabwe? Yeah. He just, he just said, so when, when does one attain spirituality? And you just wrote the answer here, when someone has the desire for spirituality. Absolutely. Because we're a desire to receive. And if I want spirituality, and I mean I really, really want it, right? This is out of the heart. It's not in words, all right? That's when the Creator feels a person's heart, all right? Because the Creator doesn't really listen to our lip service. He is a feeling being. And this is why we're also sensual beings, right? In, in the 21st century, <clears throat> since the 20th century, actually, we've been taught and educated in such a way that as if we are made just from a brain, which in fact we're not. A brain is actually a secondary tool. The only thing it does is it has a memory bank and it's a good calculator because from everything I've learned and experienced in life, I can use my brain to calculate what I can do in order to get maximum pleasure with minimum effort. And this is the only thing it works for. It doesn't generate thought, doesn't generate creativity, nothing. So the brain is how we've been educated with throughout these years. However, the Kabbalists are saying, well, listen, if you had been educated 
through actually sensing your desires, we would have been much smarter because first of all, we would have found out what we really want in life. And if I know what I want in life, really, then I can go for it. And then I could be smart about it because I'd be looking for ways to fulfill that desire. This is why there are a lot of people in the world who haven't really achieved much. And there are a few people in the world who are like billionaires and there are even less successful politicians and there are even less, less, less than that scientists. Why? Because the generality of humanity doesn't really know what they want in life. They're just roaming and flowing with life, you know, flowing with the currents of life, let's say, right? Just you know, flying with the wind. However, a person who knows what he wants or what she wants goes for it. And that is critical because then your brain begins to think and calculate according to that desire. Well, the same thing, the same principle works for spirituality. If I want to be spiritual, if I want to really perceive a new reality, I have to build it. But in order to build it, I have to have a big desire for it so I can find ways and utilize everything in my surrounding to make that happen. And the last lesson I wanted to talk about, the fourth lesson, was a topic you did from the love of others to the love of the creator. Now, all of a sudden, this topic kind of like pops in there out of the blue and you're wondering, well, what's that got to do with the perception of reality or or studying Kabbalistic books? The reason I saved that for for the last is because it's the best. It's the best topic. Now, spirituality, just like I mentioned a while ago in the perception of reality, talks about sensing sensing the creator okay let's say this is me i'm just not going to worry about all the details okay okay these are our five senses spirituality is really focusing on perceiving what's outside of me and the kabbalists are saying well what's outside of us is just the creator okay However, we don't see him or feel him because he uses this world, okay, everything in this world or this reality, let's say, okay, reality, in order to have us live a life here, okay? I'm actually living in my head. However, I think, because I see everything on the outside that I think there's a world out there where in fact there isn't there's just a creator influencing me and I'm living a life inside my head okay great well how are we going to come to the point where I actually understand feel and know I'm living it in my head and how am I actually going to feel the creator so we can actually have this world or reality as a conductor or a communication tool. Okay, communication tool. So I need to develop such an organ, such a sense, such an understanding, a feeling, a sensation, okay, that this world and everything that happens in it to me becomes a language between me and the Creator. That's what we have to build. In order to build that, well, the Kabbalists are saying you have to kind of get out of yourself. Well, it's easier said than done, especially if I don't know what I'm doing. So the Kabbalists are saying, well, this is a really easy thing to do as well. All you have to do is start behaving in a different way. How's that? Well, since we have an environment... Okay, this is our environment. We've got the Rav. Now, the Rav is using the books to teach us what to do. And all of us, all right, this is the friends. These are the friends, right? So we've got the group. Okay, so these are my friends. And let's say this is me, 
Okay. Who's with us today? Any any friends there? We got a lot of friends. We got about thirty five friends with us today. Jose, the I world. read there. Jose Carlos. He's from Spain. Okay. Portugal. So this is Jose. There you go, Jose. Okay. So Jose is thinking, well, okay, I've got the Rav, I've got the books, we're studying Kabbalah, and I've got the friends. So how am I going to start making this happen? That instead of feeling this world inside of me, as it seems like on the outside, and start building this relationship with the Creator, how am I ever going to get out of my skin mm -hmm. if I'm always living inside me? Okay. Well, the Kabbalists are saying it's just the way we're thinking that's wrong. Because our nature is constantly wanting to receive for ourselves. The Kabbalists are saying, well, in that mode, there's no way I'm going to feel anything on the outside because I'm directed to self-fulfillment. Okay, great. So how am I going to feel the Creator on the outside if I am receiving everything inside of me? Well, very easy. If I begin to think the opposite of what I'm thinking right now. If I begin to act the opposite of what I'm doing right now, then I have an opportunity to start changing my perception because I'm changing my outlook and my attitude to life, to my nature, actually. Because when we're talking about life, we're really talking about human nature. So Jose says, okay, great. How am I going to do that? Well, love your neighbor like yourself or what was the topic from the love of others to come to the love of the creator sounds a bit out there but think about it let's say you have a baby all right and you really love your child you can begin to feel that because you're so focused on that baby you actually lose the sensation of your own life. This is so true for mothers. This is also in corporeality. I see some, it's true for some guys who are like mad about their girlfriends. Okay, it's like complete cuckoo and they just forget themselves completely and they're just completely in love. All right, and they'll do anything for their girlfriends or some girls for their boyfriends. Okay, why? Because they're just so in love with them they just forget about themselves okay so if you love someone think about the time and the effort you take to pick a gift for that person because you're constantly thinking about what would she like or he like um what should i get for her how should i present it to her oh my god it's her birthday oh my god it's valentine's day oh my god it's christmas new year what have you all right during out throughout the the year you have all these times where you can buy gifts. And if you really love someone, you're really thinking about them. Well, so the Kabbalists are saying, well, that's great. Now try to do it with someone you're not that much into. And those guys are the friends. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because, well, first of all, the guys in the group, we don't know, right? So anybody could be in the group. So, for example, Chris is from Texas. He's American. I'm Turkish. And, well, there you go. Right, from two different parts of the planet, we're in the group and the Kabbalists are saying it's really easy to love your wife or your child or your parents because they're like, you know, close to you. But try loving a Texan. Come Just on. Just try. Just try, How okay? I really have to slap my neck and make it all red. And that's going to be hard to do. But that's how you get spiritual. When you begin to think about somebody who you normally wouldn't. Okay, and that's the whole trick. So this whole thing in religions and spiritual things about loving others, well, it's true if you use it correctly in order to stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about somebody else more than you think about yourself. Piece of cake, right, Chris? Piece of cake. Absolutely. And the tool that helps us do that is the environment. This is why freedom of will is the most important place where you exert your effort. Now, because I need to think about Chris more than I think about me in order to attain something outside of me, I have to make some 
effort into wanting to do that. Because at the end of the day, we are a desire to receive. And I can't change my nature, only the Creator can. So we have here a bit of a a bit of a triangle, okay? It's a bit of a love and hate relationship between all the aspects that are here, okay? So we have like, let me just draw this right, maybe I can draw it here. Here is the creator, okay? Here is Jose, and here is the group. And this triangle needs to all kind of come together all nicely and match. So we're studying the books from a Kabbalist, in order to change our nature into a bestowing nature, like the Creator, instead of self-reception. And the, all of that study and work needs to make me want to change. So the Creator will say, oh my God, he wants to change. Great, I think I will change him. And hey, presto, we change. Okay? Does that sound like magic? It would normally, but because we're studying Kabbalah and it's a process of development, just like a child grows throughout the years <clears throat> and begins to understand what this world is all about, or seemingly what it's all about, same for our spiritual development. As we put ourselves onto the path, we begin to discover, we begin to enter this journey of self-discovery of me, my place in reality, the place of all my friends, my family, my teacher, everybody else on the planet, and how the Creator is kind of using everything that He created in order to influence me, in order to see through everything, to understand Him, and to live in a new way of existing, like in a soul. All right, so all of that in a nutshell would have been your first five lessons. So today, we're in the sixth lesson, question and answer. So I hope you have a lot of questions. But before we go on to the questions, let's watch a short clip about the environment. So this can really resonate with us. So here's a new clip. Also, the world that is depicted before me is all given in advance. My qualities, my thoughts, even the fact that I'm standing here and asking. Every given matter in any given moment comes from above. So I'm controlled 100% for this moment. From this moment onwards, for the next moment, it's already in your hands. So here comes the question. In spiritual development, when you come to attainment, so what will be the difference in our thoughts or our desires? Will I all of a sudden feel that they are mine? Also, now I think that they're mine. You can think whatever you want. We're talking about a person who begins scrutinizing what he can change his destiny with. What's the point in his life? Can I reach in my understanding of life? All of a sudden, he doesn't just discover life. You can change life. All of a sudden, you are, it's revealed to you that you can not just can change them, but you can come to the highest degree of perception, of grasping, of understanding, of defining the state, controlling everything. How? You have from 1,000 buttons, one button with which you can spin all those 1,000 buttons. You can. They won't bother you. All those 999 buttons won't bother you if this button's in your hand. And this button is called free will. You need to discover this button and then you go from side to side each time with different work, a different scrutiny with this button. And it's not that you're holding on to it like this. You grabbed it and that's it to the end of the way. No, you need to constantly search for it. Where is it? They're, they're between all of them, I have a thousand buttons. Where is it? Now it's here. And then what can I spin with it where it's specifically here? And in the next state, in the next degree, where is it? Oh, it's here. Wow. And so this is how you change. 
It's not some kind of superficial work, and this work moves you from place to place, throws you from one side to another and within your matrix, within your conditions, and through, th through them, by you having this button, you can operate all the rest of the buttons. But it's an approach towards everyone. The free choice obligates us to come to a group all in all. What are we talking about here? What big deal do we have here all in all? To come to a group, to come to an environment, to come under the influence of an environment. If you're under the influence of that environment, together with the environment, in connection with it, you can hold on to this button. By doing so, you change your destiny. Right, then I hope that really kind of uh, summed it up for you. Now we've got a lot of question and answer opportunity till the end of the lesson, so let's go. Ready, here we go. So you mentioned the importance of the books, and you talked about books, and you mentioned the Zohar. And so Barazi, again, he's hot, says, what, what is the difference between other spiritual books like the Bible or Quran, as opposed to the Zohar? The goal, okay, and how you perceive those books. Look, the most important thing is... First of all, what you study needs to resonate with your heart. Okay, that's the most important thing. What you're learning needs to settle inside of you and you need to feel, you know what, this is the right thing. Okay, that's the most important element when we're studying Kabbalah. Uh, so for everyone, you know, there are 4,200 religions if you ask Google. 3,800 was counted officially, but, you know, 3,800 religions, 7.5 billion people, you, anything goes. So it's really important um, for a person to feel right at the place of study. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying right or wrong to anything. What's right is what you feel is right for you. But once you decide, you need to go for it. You know, just like in life. If you decide that this is the right thing for you, you just got to go for it. Otherwise, otherwise, person gets nothing done. Right. That really connects to what um, to what uh, Jose Carlos was asking. He's saying, so there's other people like Neil Donald Walsh and and Jackie Fresco and a couple other people that that have similar ideas with Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. They're very they talk about similar things, but they're not studying Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. So, so. So what's the so what's the difference of, of how does someone arrive at the same conclusions as Kabbalah, and then you have authentic Kabbalah? Like what's what makes one better? You guys, people will come to the same conclusion because we're talking about laws of nature here, okay? And scientists and Kabbalists really talk about the same thing. However, are they attaining what's behind that governing force in reality? That's the question. Okay, it's all good to say this is how it is. Okay, that's how it is. But am I living it? Am I living exactly how it is? We're not living how it is. Therefore, it's a problem. So the Kabbalist is saying, well, look, in order to live how it is, you have to go through a change process. It's not just about knowing it. It's about living it. So life in Kabbalah is when we and that creating force called the creator are actually living in unison together. Okay, so that's very, very important. Yeah. Um, uh, so Paradzi and Yao from Ghana, they want to know more about free will. So Paradzi exp he expands a little bit and he says, so in one of the lessons in Pink Elephants, I think as we saw a clip about it or something, he taught that we're not in control of our thoughts. We're not in control of our thoughts. And you mentioned the influence of the environment. So if I'm not in control of my thoughts and then the free choice is in the environment, then kind of what's the connection there? Well, how do I, how am I, how all of a sudden does free choice kind of appear? Well, easy. I make a decision on what I want in life. Okay. Let's say I want to be a football player. If I want to be a football player, I don't hang out with stamp collectors, do I? I hang out with football players. Why? Because I want to be a football player. I want them to influence me. I want to be better because I'm working out with them. If I wanted to be a stamp collector, I'd hang out with stamp collectors. Same thing. If I'm hanging out with a bunch of football players and I want to be a football player, I'm going to be practicing, running. I'm going to be trying harder to be better. 
I'm going to use the environment to be better. Well, same with Kabbalah. Same with spirituality. Kabbalah is saying, if you want to be a Kabbalist, you've got to hang out with some really good Kabbalists and make sure you learn the real deal. And then really work on yourself by using the influence of the environment so you can really excel. And that's the whole idea. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yes, uh, Jose uh, also had something to say about that, about getting getting changed through our thoughts and, there, and you can just experience that on yourself you can see how you when you put yourself under a certain influence you start thinking about those things sometimes dreaming about them and you'll you'll have certain desires the same desires that they have and it's the same thing if you're in an environment where their desires are to attain spirituality and and it just turns out that you have you're the complete opposite to that you don't want anything to do with spirituality maybe you don't know that now but it sounds like it's really good, but actually it's the opposite of you, which means that in the end, you will feel that you don't exist. But you'll feel a different existence. You'll identify with something else, but to your ego, this is, this is death. Uh, so uh, uh, Let's put it simply, right? Let's put it simply. Let's say I'm watching a movie right now, and because I'm watching that movie, I'll have thoughts regarding things that happen in that movie either during the movie or during the day. Okay, sometimes it happens, right? You watch a movie and then during the day you're kind of thinking about what happened in the movie. Well, think about it now this way. Instead of watching the movie, I was reading a book. Okay, let's say a spiritual book or a Kabbalah book, doesn't matter. Then I'd be thinking about, oh yeah, you know what? I read that in the book and, and I think that's how that is in the book and so on. Why? One's a movie, one's a book. It doesn't really matter. They both influence me. Okay, so whatever I'm influenced by makes me think about that. So the stronger the influence on me with respect to what I want to attain, my thoughts are going to be more directed and will be stronger with respect to what I want to attain. Yeah. So Nella says from Serbia, she says... Who? Nella. Nella. Yeah. She says uh, feelings. But when, we, when you start studying Kabbalah, you become a lot more aware of things that you're undergoing, a little, the small subtle changes, you're thinking something and then you realize you're thinking something and you feel something. So she's asking, so what, what do I do when feelings come up within me and, and, and I don't want to be driven by them? I feel like I'm being controlled by them. What, what do I do? That's actually a good, good evaluation. You begin to understand that you know, certain things outside your control are controlling you. Okay, so that's a good thing because... Now you come to the understanding that you're not in control of yourself. That's an advanced, it, that's an advanced understanding. That's, that's already, pretty good. Yeah. Okay, that's already an understanding that you don't control yourself. Well, that's cool. Because now you can say, well, what do I need to do about it? Well, I need to choose the right environment according to the influence I want to get. So if I want to have a more Kabbalistic influence, then what I'd be doing is, well, okay, now that I understand that outside is controlling me and I just realized that now I have an opportunity to make a free choice that's actually where you can make a free choice when you come to that understanding because if if you hadn't woken up and if you hadn't thought that oh these thoughts are controlling me now or they're taking me into all kinds of other different irrelevant thoughts you would have never had the opportunity to make that choice so that's actually a lovely situation because you're controlled by the outside and you understand you're controlled by the outside. Now I can decide on what is going to be influencing me. What I want to influence me. Yeah. Um, we've talked about the point in the heart a little bit. And, and so once, you, once this point in the heart awakens, then you are already have different priorities in life. Uh, but you still, it can be a little bit confusing, and maybe. And Parazi again from Zimbabwe is saying, "So what do I? So what do I do? What do I do when I feel regret?" Now we don't really know exactly what regret he's talking about, but this is just another feeling, like Nella talked about feeling. So regret is also another feeling, but this happens to be a negative feeling. What doesn't, do you do with this? Doesn't really matter. I tell you why it doesn't matter. All the feelings that kind of pop up inside of me, the thoughts that pop up inside of me, are kind of like spontaneous and I really don't have control over them. And I'm not really supposed to have control over them. All these methods about self-control, not really going to work. The reason is, life will bring us to a situation where we understand that we don't have any control 
on anything. So the things that pop up inside of me in terms of feelings, thoughts, inclinations and so on, they're not bad things. They're just little hints that the creator is, is basically putting in front of me and saying, you know what, you can feel good or you can feel bad, but what's more important to you? What's your goal in life? What's, the, what's that thing that you want to attain? Because a lot of people get stuck in these things that they that hurt themselves, you know, that they hurt, they have a hurt feeling, and they're kind of delving in it and wasting a lot of time when in fact we don't need to. Okay, so I did something bad, I regretted it, I understand, I'm not going to do it again because I have a bad feeling about it now, but now I need to come on, move and start going forward with what I want to attain in life. Because you can't bring back the past. And the only way you're going to improve the future is by making the right decision at that point in time. Okay, and and basically, uh, this is why this is why freedom of will is the fundamental uh, pillar in the wisdom of Kabbalah because it's the only place where I can make an effort. The influence of the right environment should grow me, just like in this in this world. A good environment on a kid will excel him, will improve him. This is why a lot of families pay thousands of dollars to give their kids a good education. Okay, Kabbalists are saying that's exactly what we should be doing. We should be giving ourselves the best possible education. How? By choosing the right environment. So just focus on freedom of will and what you need to do in order to get to the goal ASAP. And we understand that we're talking about a lot of, as of now, theoretical ideas, things that we aren't able to exactly put into practice. Because now we, you don't have a group, maybe you're looking to be in contact with some people, you want to be able to start trying out all these methods, and we understand that. I see a lot of you here are re really eager to get in a group, and I've spoken to some of you privately, um, and... We just wanted to reassure you that this is, we understand that we understand the path, we understand the stages that we need to go through. And again, I'll just reiterate that we're, you have a great desires and we have, uh, we do have plans and we have a system set up to start introducing people into groups, introducing them into, into this interaction between, uh, between people with point in the hearts and to start working there a little bit. So we know that you're eager and it's coming up. After we finish this semester, we'll, I think we, go, we, get, we get into the thing where we'll start having a Zoom. If you haven't, if you haven't used Zoom, if you don't know what Zoom is, it's, uh, it's an application that allows us to communicate like Skype. And you're able, you see each other in the same room and everyone can talk and ask questions and interact. And we have a whole thing set up for that and it's in the future. We have plans for it. Uh, don't worry. And you'll be able to start really grasping the material in a much different way because you start working with it. Like a, like, a, like a craftsman, like a woodworker who's worked many, 20, 30 years with, the, with his materials. He understands the materials very well. He knows how to, how, which, all the qualities of each kind of wood. And so you'll also uh, attain these, these same principles with, according to the work in the group. And you'll become very fine and a master at it. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so... Uh, uh, James from Nigeria, sorry, yes, you wanted to know the topic of the discussion, but we, we were just recapping and we're going to have some questions uh, at the end. So the sixth sense, sixth sense, uh, Parazzi says, you talked about developing a new sense outside of my five natural ones. So what, it feels like we're building a new sense, but how do we build it? Where is this new sense? How do we? Well, that's we the whole that? idea. Okay, look, this is probably in the, in the future lessons to come, but let's just let's just try to figure it out let's just try to do things a little practically okay now here in this world in my five senses whoops um, undo this is my life here okay and the sixth sense that we're talking about is just an inclination doesn't exist okay doesn't exist it's just an inclination now the purpose of life is to be like the creator to understand his thoughts to attain his attributes and to be like him now in order to be like him 
I have to kind of rebuild creation. How am I going to do that? Well, you know, if you, if you read religious books, they say, I created you out of nothing, you know, out of dust. You know, man was created out of dust. So from dust, he created such a creature that can come to a potential to attain something great. So the Creator created us out of nothing. So we have to create a soul out of nothing, literally. Okay? Why? Well, that's the only way I can attain what He did and why He did it. So this inclination called dot in the heart can be nurtured if I'm in the right environment. Now, when we are studying, this is what happens. We have the books. Okay, so the Rav is teaching us the books. And plus we've got the friends. And we've got the creator like on the side. Okay, is that kind of looking at us what's going on? If I have an inclination for spirituality and I'm studying, what I get from the environment is called light. And that is the thing that's feeding my soul. It's the thing, it's the force actually that grows me. Now, it's called light, but don't think of light like some airy fairy thing coming from the skies, you know, like they make it out in the movies. You know, those movies, sometimes these preachers are talking, they go, hey, and the light came down in a blinding way from the sky. We're obviously not talking about something silly like that. Light means wisdom. It is a force that develops my sensation and my understanding. This is the same force that develops children, that develops all of us in life. As we grow up, we begin to have an understanding. We begin to have a sensation of those around us. First, when a baby is born, the only thing the baby feels is actually himself or herself and what the mother gives him or her. Okay? The baby doesn't feel what's on the outside. The baby just feels about suckling on that milk. And that's all. And this is how we are as well. We're just in our own little world. We live in our own little box. And we have no idea about what's going on in the whole of reality. And then we end up dead. So the Kabbalists are saying, well, the way to change that is to use the Creator's light. And the only way we can do that is if we want it, okay? Because he's not going to give us something we don't want. So the Kabbalists are saying, just like I said a while ago, that, well, we're a desire to receive. So why don't we use our nature in order to get what we're supposed to get? Let's use our desire to receive. Oops. Let's use our desire to receive in order to get what the Creator wants to give us. Okay? It's like, a be- it's like a kid who's a good kid, right? So he does his homework, he's really good in school, he does everything great, and his dad buys him a bicycle because that's what he wanted. Same with us. If we're developing in such a way that the Creator wants us to develop in that way, to come to perfection, to come to an amazing understanding about everything that's happening in reality and to actually participate in the whole of creation just like the Creator, then He's going to say, okay, you guys earned it. Here, take it. We have to want it. So we're using our nature, our desire to receive by the environment to grow a new desire for spirituality. And that's how we're going to change. So as you can see now, as we learn things, right, the, how the components are coming together. All right, so I have, again, this lesson maybe brought a few things together. Our nature is a desire to receive. 
we can use it in order to get what the creator wants to give us not what we want to get in life okay if we work in that direction by using our freedom of choice because he's not going to push us and force us he wants to he wants us to grow up ourselves so we use our freedom of choice in order to get into the right environment so that we can want from the help with the help of that environment we could want what the creator wants to give us then we grow that desire and the creator will give it to us and we will achieve spirituality that's, Just, a, that's a good yeah. point that you mentioned that the desire uh, we have to get the desire for spirituality from the group from the environment the uh, it's a good point here to always reiterate because we always want to go back in ourselves and always want spirituality for ourselves but spirituality the desire for spirituality doesn't exist inside any of us it exists in the environment it exists between us this is why you have to have it's not he's not just writing rav books and friends friends meaning people that are around me friends meaning it's a necessary tool it's a it's a it's a, it's you're all obligated if you want to attain spirituality if you want to reveal the creator you have to have a place to reveal it. So basically, I have to use my freedom of will to stick my head into that environment. That's where my freedom of choice is. Okay. Uh, Miriam from Turkey. You have a Turkish friend. She's, oh my she's, God. she's so happy to see you again. But she it has a question about one of the textbooks. Kabbalah Unveiled. I think I remember reading this as well. This is not this is not a source text. It's one of the, it's one Michael Lightman wrote, mm -hmm. I believe. I don't know if they have it in Persian. I'm sorry, uh, Maya, but we do. This is how we get all of our translations. Okay, that's she might have read it in Turkish because we've got a bunch of books in Turkish. You have it in Turkish. You can thank this guy if you have it in Turkish. He has another guy, another friend as well who who translated a lot. And if you would like to translate in Persian, uh, that's how we get all our translations. Just friends that are with us, and if they don't have the books, then they build a team and they start translating. So, well, maybe we can talk later and we can figure out if we can get it in Persian for you if you haven't. But again, you'll have to go to kablabooks.info and see if they have anything in Persian. I'm not sure. I haven't seen anything in Persian as far as I know. Uh, but you're asking, is it, is it useful? It could be. It could be useful, one of the, the books that uh, Michael Lightman writes. But if you're already here, then you're, you've, you're kind of already are getting the answers that you would find in that book. It's any, any book that's on kablabooks.info I think is good for you. I don't think, um, you know, it, it's, it's good to read all the sources that we have. Also, if you go to our website, um, it'll be very helpful for you. Okay, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of materials there. So, using the website, using our materials to read and to enrich in yourself, I think is a very good idea. I remember for myself when I first started studying, before I even joined the group, I read everything. Yeah, everything. And I mean everything. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, and, and, and in those days, we didn't have all those books. We just had um, some articles from Bala Salam translated, some articles from Rabash translated, and that was it. It was just articles. Uh, there, were, there wasn't a lot of books um, by Dr. Michael Lightman, except, um, except one of his first Attaining ones, the world, Attaining yeah. the Worlds Beyond. And everything they had in English, uh, I'd, I'd read, and then I decided, you know what, this is what I want to study. And then I joined the group and I started studying. We didn't have any education center then at all. Mm -mm. You know, this was 16 years ago. Um, so, but you guys are lucky. This is a very good stepping stone for you all. But reading a lot of the sources is very helpful. So I do recommend it. You should really feel lucky because we didn't have this nice drawing board a long time ago. We had like a projector with like pen and paper. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and again, about the Zoom, you're right, I forgot, sorry, who asked, Jose Carlos, yes, we could, there was an option to have Zoom in, in this class, and the data that we got back was that, that a lot of the people that would be connecting with us, maybe they wouldn't have such a great internet connection, so also, we were a little bit worried about also, it. Also, guys, I, I understand the enthusiasm to rush, but let's, let's, you know, let's start to call before we can walk and run. Okay. It's very important for us to first get over this semester with the foundations, with the, with the basis, uh, with, the, with the knowledge and the foundation and the pillar stones before we move forward. So just trust us on that. We're really giving you the best we can so we can build the next level on a solid ground. Okay. Uh, we have a friend from Romania. He's asking... If I apply in my regular life, like family, work, 
children and friends. What I learned in Kabbalah, it, isn't that like an egoistic way of studying? Like the, if I want to, if I want to take what I learned here in Kabbalah and kind of apply that somehow to, I'm mean, using it to better my life. You know, I want to, you know. You know, it's not a sin to better your life. Uh, it's just a matter of <clears throat> what is a better life. Okay, so if you think about it, the question is, is uh, we all want to better our lives. We're not studying Kabbalah because we want to be angels. <clears throat> Obviously, we want to better our life. We study spirituality because the Creator wants to give us the best life ever. So the question here is, what's your idea of a better life? Um, using the principles that we learn here to manage our life in order to attain uh, something higher is is obviously what we need to do um, but you know like I said it's a matter of perspective of what you think is a better life um, our perspective as students of Kabbalah who study here at Petah Tikva uh, the generality of the students here as I've been studying throughout the years is that we have an understanding of better life being a good connection between people having that loving relationship between people in order to attain the attributes of the Creator. Um, that's our understanding of a better life because a better life on the outside, on the corporeal world, is not really going to happen. In fact, life will always get worse until a person does attain. Um, so, this, the sooner a person looks at the world and understands that the state of the world is going from bad to worse, and then he can actually make a logical uh, an intuitive, logical, rational, intelligent decision and say, you know what, it's getting worse all the time, so it's not really going to happen that way. So what I need to do is come to an understanding of what the meaning of, what the purpose of life is, and go for that. That's exactly the development of the ego. Even egoistically, he starts feeling, maybe it is worthwhile to, to change the way that I receive. For the ego... A better life is just put more inside, receive more, get more fulfillment, and we know that that's not possible anymore. And you know that's why you're that's why you're here because you're looking for that extra fulfillment that you that your ego isn't letting you get. Uh, and so, uh, so here we have a friend asking Barbara from uh, Holland or Spain is asking, how do I love the Creator? First, you need to learn how to love others because there's no difference actually. That's a good question. We can't love the Creator simply because, well, He's not there. All right? So, none of, you know, we don't see Him, right? If I saw Him, if I spoke to Him, if I understood Him, if I saw how He related to me and I understood that it was good, I'd say, you know what? I love you. I think you're the best God ever. However, He's not around. But <clears throat> that's not such a bad thing because. Who asked? Oh, this is Barbara from Holland. Barbara. And Spain. So this is Barbara. Okay. The Creator is outside of me. Well, guess who else is outside of me? All my other friends in the group. Right? They're also outside of me because I don't feel like they're inside of me, do I? I'm like Chris is outside of me. There is 50 centimeters away sitting there. However, the Kabbalists are saying, what's the big deal? If I love my friends or I love the Creator, what's the difference? They're saying there is no difference. They're both outside of me in the perception of reality. So if I actually learn to love my friends, just like I, lo I, I love myself, just like I think about myself, I start to think about them, or I even, you know, I try to do it, this effort attracts light. What is the light? Light is actually the Creator helping us, giving us a hand, holding us by the hand, giving us wisdom, understanding, feeling, sensation. All the feelings that we're going through inside of us are the help of the Creator when I'm trying to love somebody, which I normally wouldn't. And the Kabbalists are saying, since my friends and the Creator are both outside of me, actually... There's no difference between loving my friends and loving the Creator. It's actually the same thing. So if I was to actually love my friends, which I feel, see, hear, no touch, just like I love me, I'd actually feel the Creator as well. Because they're both outside of me. 
So the best way you can get to love the Creator is first by loving the friends. This is why love thy neighbor as thyself is the biggest rule in spirituality. We, we think this is some kind of a airy-fairy, you know, be a good kid kind of advice. But it's not. It's actually the key to changing the whole outlook on reality. That's great. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's tied a little bit to what Paul is asking. He's saying, so there's, there's this illusion. Everything outside of me is an illusion. Yeah. I see it differently than the way that it actually is. Uh-huh. And so that's what we're being told. But what is it? Are they real? You know, I have people around me, dear people that are close to me, like, you know, that I feel they're, how, it's like kind of confusing. If they're real, how do, I, how do I supposed to relate to something that I know is an illusion? Okay. Um, that's a good question, Paul. First of all, the Kabbalists are saying, don't go into La La Land. What the Kabbalists are writing is the state that they are living in and they're writing about because that's how they see things. But we're not there yet. So if I'm not there, and if I'm seeing Chris as a person outside of me, as my friend, then he's there as an outside person. So I'm not thinking about Chris living in the back of my head in perception of reality. I'm thinking about Chris. He's another guy on the planet who's studying Kabbalah with us. And he's, he's about, oh, well, if I'm studying Kabbalah, that's different. But if I don't study Kabbalah, then to the ego, he's just another guy that's taking resources that I could be using somehow. He's bothering my existence. <laughs> okay, don't, don't confuse everyone. <laughs> okay, so basically I need to relate to reality in a logical, okay, sound and healthy way. Right now, we are not at the level that the Kabbalists are talking about. I see people around me. I see this world and so on. So I need to manage this life just like I would have managed it before I started studying Kabbalah. So I keep the rules of corporeality as they should be maintained. As I advance... And as I see and perceive reality in a deeper way, then you will also learn to adapt and live it in that way. But right now, we're living in this corporeal world. So I don't need to go into any airy-fairy illusion and say to myself, Oh my God, everybody's living inside of me and I'm the only person on the planet. Okay? We have to be logical, realistic, and in a safe, healthy way, look at the world and say, Well, this is how it is. Okay? So we live life. Just like you've been living, okay, until today, you carry on living like this. As you change, you will see that you'll need to adapt, and you will adapt nice and safely. Okay? Laws are still laws. The Creator created the, the society, created the world. If there's no else besides Him, then, this, then the, everything, the structure that we see, He was the one that created it. And they exist for a reason. They exist for us to still abide by them. We'll, even in whenever we enter spirituality, we'll still see that this, this is the way that it, needs to, that it needs to be because it's according to the general public. It's according to the entire structure of the soul that was created. I'm still a part of that soul, and I still need to, uh, I still need to act with it appropriately. And so we're not going to be going, yeah, we're not going to be going, and, 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 and you can really confuse yourself thinking that, start trying to take a different approach to life, acting like it's an illusion instead of according to the laws that I need to behave. And, and like in society. And you wouldn't be able to help it anyways. You wouldn't be able to act against the will of the society most of the time. Uh, so, um, so, ah, so great. Jose Carlos from Spain. And maybe this is our last question. Maybe. Uh, he says, so Nebuch is the only organization that could actually put into pr- practice to unite people in the right way. Could we think of on this like a construction uh, of a new society? Bnei Baruch is a new society. Um, I wouldn't like to go out there and say we are the only society that's doing it or whatever. whatever. We have our methods and we have a way of studying and learning Kabbalah according to the sources that we've, we've, we have. Okay? Uh, and from the generations that before us prepared the sources for us. So a person needs to go and check what's right for them. We as Bnei Baruch um, are learning, studying and teaching the wisdom of Kabbalah according to the principles uh, as best we can handed down to us all the way from Adam, Noah, Abraham and so forth. Uh, 
Miriam, she's the one who asked about the book in Persian. She's Iranian living in Turkey. Okay, there's a good group in Turkey. So if you stick around with us, uh, you might have a good opportunity to uh, to study with us. We actually have an Iranian friend who also lives in Turkey in in the city of Mersin. He's half Iranian, half Turkish. So if you feel like you, you want to study with the group later on, you should um, finish the education center. Now we have a, a, shoot a few more short questions there, Chris, quickly. How difficult, from Jose Carlos, how difficult is it to work with the friends? I mean, come on, it's, what, how, what is it like? It's, like? Guys, it's as difficult as you convince yourselves to be. It's not difficult. All you have to do is just want to do it, okay? Bala Salam writes that it's a small psychological switch in the brain in order to see the, way, the things that happen. Just, we just don't know where that switch is. That's if you keep about. telling yourself it's hard, it'll be hard. If you keep telling yourself, you know what, this is the easiest thing ever, it'll be easy. Okay. Shoot a few more short questions there, Chris. Uh, oh, okay, great. Um, just wanted to remind you guys quickly if you haven't joined the facebook page yet then uh you definitely invited to do so there's a lot of people sharing their impressions and their thoughts and maybe questions as well and we take some of those questions from the page if there are any and we ask them here in the lesson as well if you didn't get to answer them but i'm, I'm trying to get through all of them as much as we can um so Kay from holland says i already have people around me that i don't like that's good. Good. Mm -hmm. Does the same method apply to them? Does a cobbler behave the same to these people as to friends? No. No. Great question. Because this be love needs to be mutual. Okay. In a group of cobblers, we have an understanding that we're applying a method in order to have some personal change. The people on the outside are not studying this method and they're not inclined to go through that personal change. So the best way to do it is only in the group where people understand that we're studying a methodology in order to go through some personal evolution, okay, an evolution process so that we can change. But we have a mutual understanding. Okay, so you can't do this with people who don't have a mutual understanding. All right, let's end it with Paul. Paul says... Do we attain spirituality in this life? We all this Absolutely. Path. Absolutely. Well, that's the whole idea, Paul, because nothing is going to happen when a person dies. I'm happy to break the I'm really happy to break this good news to you. Okay, a lot of people think something's going to happen when they die. I got some good news. Everything that we're supposed to attain, we need to attain when we're in this world living here. All right. After we die, we become worm food. So it's best that we study now and nail it while we can. Now, guys, next lesson, next Tuesday. Next Am Tuesday. Right? All right. Any announcements there, next Chris? Tuesday. I didn't get any special announcements. The main, mainly the announcement was about uh, joining the Facebook group. All right. Great. So, guys, please join along. Tag along. Um, let's finish this semester nice and easy. Um, and you'll see that things are flowing really smooth once we all get into the rhythm of things okay things will settle down if there's anything unclear or you know you've not really understood some of the concepts it's okay we're not supposed to understand everything in one go there'll be a lot of opportunity to go over these things and we'll have a lot of question and answer sessions in the future as well so just enjoy the process i'm definitely enjoying the process i hope you are too i definitely am i see a lot of people are really having a lot of questions a lot of uh, a lot of just they're anxious already to start to join the group and I promise that I promise we'll get there and Miriam by the way if you can just send in your email if you can send your email to the chat uh, no one else will see it I'll only see it and then uh, and we'll we'll be in touch and also if you have any um, uh, any suggestions any recommendations how we can improve the way we present things please send them through uh, because you know we all obviously want to give you guys the best that we can uh, in the way we present things. So if there's anything that you think you feel that we can improve, do let us know and we'll do our best. In the interim, <laughs> thank you very much for being with us and thank you to the technical guys in there who've bared us uh, and we'll see you all guys next week. Have a great week already. Thanks, bye.